Hello, welcome to Jason the Old Millennial. My name is Jason. Speaking to you here in my basement in the great state of Kansas. Today's video, I'm continuing my series on ranking all my 100 favorite movies of all time. And we are now down to my top 25 favorite movies. So in this uh, video, we're gonna do 25 through 21 on the list. So uh, we're starting to get there. Just maybe four or five more videos left on this series, hopefully get done by the end of the year. But yeah, man. What can I say? Some definitely some uh, combination of old classics, uh, some newer animation actually on here as well, and uh, yeah, definitely, definitely uh, the ending to a really classic series as well on here. So, um, I hope you enjoy this here on Jason the Old Millennial. Hello everybody, hope everybody's doing well here on a Monday afternoon. And um, today's Veterans Day, so I want to definitely special shout out to all the veterans. Thank you so much for um, what you do, your sacrifice to the country. Um, really appreciate everything that our veterans have done for us. And great day to honor them. Um, my grandpa, who's not alive anymore, he fought in the Korean War. Uh, um, his name was James Curry. Uh, and my uncle, Uncle Kevin, uh, Kevin Curry, also he fought in Desert Storm back in the 90s. Um, so yeah, special th shout out to those two. Um, thank you for your service. All right, getting to now my top 25 favorite movies of all time. We're doing 25 through 21. And uh, wow, pretty good movie to start us off with. This is actually, I uh, didn't plan this, but uh, this is a World War One movie about a bio biographical movie about one of the greatest war heroes we've ever had and it is called Sergeant York uh, played by Gary Cooper as you see on on the front here um, yeah this one came out in I think 1941 um, yeah what a great classic movie I always since I first saw it back when I was like a teenager fell in love with this movie always loved this movie um, if you don't know um, Sergeant York Alvin York he a real life person who fought in World War I. Um, he was a war hero, one of the biggest war heroes at that time. He single-handedly uh, basically captured like 130 Germans or something like that. Um, yeah, absolutely incredible. And so he kind of went, he kind of was um, really beloved at this point. Um, of course, 1941, he's um, a little bit older and retired by this point, but they really wanted to make a, they've been trying to get a movie about him for a long time, I think, at this point. And he wasn't sure at first because he didn't want to glorify his war days because he was a very interesting um, person because he was a conscious, conscious objector or whatever. I'm not saying that right. Conscientious objector. Because uh, he was a Christian, he didn't believe in going to war, didn't believe in killing people. You know, of course, he was um, on the whole, you know, shall not, thou shall not kill part of the Ten Commandments. And but... He was still drafted into the war, and though he wasn't happy, he fought bravely and valiantly, like I said, and helped capture uh, like uh, over 100 Germans or something like that, um, single-handedly, basically. Um, like I said, so definitely incredible that he went from a guy that doesn't want to do any killing to being a guy who was a hero and very beloved that. Though, like I said, he he's not really, he doesn't really like to talk about his war time, you know, he doesn't. He hates that. He had to do that. He did what he did because he needed to do it to save lives. And that's what I love about the character is that um, he, and he was a good shot because he was a hunter and he actually was actually quite good. And that's why he became a sergeant and everything. And he was a really good soldier. And, but he felt like by doing what he did, he actually saved American lives. So he looked in that rain, like he hated that he had to kill people, but he felt that he was killing them. He was saving lives. So uh, which I agree with. I think that's a very noble thing. Like I said, to be a to be in the armed forces and to have to be called upon to go to war, 
which is unfortunately a thing that has to happen every once in a while. We'd hate to do it. We That's our last thing we want to do is go to war. But every once in a while, someone, something comes along and you're kind of forced, your hand is forced at some points. And, but you're fighting for a good cause. You're fighting for freedom. You're fighting to um, protect others, you know. So there's a good cause there to go to war at some points anyway. So I, like I said, so much appreciation to our troops for being able to do that, be willing to go sacrifice for the country and for our freedom, like this guy, uh, Mr. Alvin York. But yeah, um, yeah, man, what a great movie. Uh, I do love, there's like two halves to this movie. The first half is really about Alvin York's conversion to Christianity, which I think is actually really great. Being a Christian myself, I feel actually a lot of emotion during those scenes. Because he's uh, he, he doesn't believe in God at the beginning of the movie, and he's a bit of a, a rebel, I guess. He goes out into the bars and drinks and gets into fights and uh, and all that. And so, and that's, that's some of that's true in real life. But they kept trying his his mother and uh, the the pastors. The pastor is so great, played by Walter Brennan, a, a great character actor. Um, who was nominated, I believe, as well. By the way, uh, Gary Cooper won the Oscar for Best Actor for this role. I mean, it's one of his great roles. Uh, yeah, and so they're, they keep trying to convert him, and he's like, well, uh, I feel like, you know, I, I won't believe until God, like, you know, you know, something really major happens, and God really makes it, you know, without a doubt that he's real, you know, or something like that. You know, it's, besides that, you know, he wants to keep going on his ways. And then there's a moment where in the movie, it's, it didn't happen in real life, but it's fictionalized, but it's really cool where um, he's going to go kill somebody for revenge and lightning hits him and, and destroys his gun. He, his gun is destroyed and he's, but he's okay, not hurt at all. And he kind of looks up to heaven like, oh, this is a sign. Like, I guess that's what I'm saying is he's looking for a sign from God. And, and in the movie, that's a sign from God that like, okay, I need to change my ways. And um, that scene, my favorite scene in the movie is uh, after that happens, he goes to church and they're singing the song and he comes up and it's kind of his conversion scene. It's very emotional. Like I get very emotional during that scene. Uh, really cool. Anyway, second half is him getting drafted into the war and him dealing with being a soldier and not wanting to, you know, kill and, and his problems with that and him coming over that. And then the actual war scenes where, they're fighting World War One, and kind of shows him how he, uh, what he did, and how he captured all these Germans. Anyway, so yeah, I like both halves. First half, I really love the whole conversion scene, but second half's good as well. The whole war stuff, and even the last part is so great. That he, he, the whole idea that you know he doesn't want to kill, but he felt like he needed to in order to save lives because he saw his own his soldiers that he you know his own friends were getting killed. So he felt like. I had to go and stop them from getting killed. Love that. Anyways, uh, but yeah, I think underrated movie, amazing. Nobody talks about this movie, probably. It's an, it's an old classic. In fact, this was the biggest box office movie of 1941. I mean, it was extremely popular. Like I said, it was nominated for Best Picture, Best Actor, Best Supporting Actor, I believe, uh, Best Director, Best... It, it got a bunch of nominations, and it didn't win Best Picture, and it should have, and it's only because of politics, I think, um, that... Uh, uh, I forget now, the John Ford movie won, um, uh, I forget, uh, How Green Is My Valley won Best Picture. This is way better than How Green Is My Valley. It's not that good of a movie. And I know people say, uh, um, what's it called? Uh, <laughs> the, the really big movie that came out that year that I'm blanking on at the moment, um, with Orson Welles, you know, uh, uh, Citizen Kane. Citizen Kane, I know people are going to say, oh, that was clearly the best picture of that year. But I say, no, this was, this should have been best picture. It was the biggest box office movie, got uh, great critic reviews. And again, it's in my top 25 favorite movies of all time. I absolutely love this movie. I'd say check it out. I know my friend Mike watched this movie and he didn't really care for it, which is unfortunate because I'm like, man, it's so good. I, I wish more people would watch it. I think it's absolutely amazing. I think give it a chance. A great World War I movie and based on a true story. All right, number 24 on my list is my favorite Pixar movie of all time. And that is Toy Story 2. Yeah, the sequel to Toy Story. Uh, as you saw on my list, Toy Story, 
and Toy Story 4 already made into my top 100. Love the Toy Story franchise. I mean, definitely the best animated franchise of all time. I know they're making like a fifth movie now. It feels like, ah, they should have left that four. Uh, some say they should have left that three, but I think four is so good. I'm glad they made a fourth one. If they make a good fifth one, I'm fine with that. It does feel like they had a good goodbye in the fourth one. But anyways, enough of that. This movie, oh my gosh. Like I said, my favorite Pixar movie, here it is number 24, one of my favorite anime movies of all time. Uh, what I love about this movie, uh, of course, we already established the characters from the first movie. And uh, Woody's storyline is really good. The whole, um, you know, what is, he's kind of questioning what is, you know, his mortality, I guess, or what's what's it going to do for, you know, when Annie grows up. It kind of, go, the whole crisis is that Annie's getting older. He's eventually going to not play with his toys. He's getting kind of that age where he's maybe not going to play with toys anymore. And once he outgrows the toys, what happens to toys? They just sit around and do nothing for the rest of their lives. They don't get played with that because their whole lives is revolved around being played with. That's what they live for. That's what it's like. That's how they feel loved is um, being played with, which is a cool concept, I think, for the for the movie series. Um, and then he gets this opportunity where he finds out that he's actually a, a uh, famous toy or he's actually worth a lot of money. Like there's not a lot of toys like him in mint condition. And so he gets this opportunity to actually go to a museum and be looked upon by, you know, lots of people and be, you know, uh, admired by a lot of people. And he has this legacy that he gets to live. And so part of him is like, you know, do I, you know, what if I go here and then I'm appreciated? I guess people appreciate me at least. While if Andy grows up and I'm just sitting in a box for the rest of my life, I'm not gonna be played with or appreciated. So it's a really cool kind of, you know, uh, conflict that he has to overcome and what to do about that. And, you know, great characters like uh, Jesse, the cowgirl, of course, and um, was it Bullseye, the horse. So some great characters coming in. I think the villain actually is really good as well. I don't want to spoil maybe who the villain is, but I think actually a pretty good villain. And the twist of who the villain is, I thought was quite good as well. Um, but then you got the whole uh, the, the rest of the gang led by um, Buzz Lightyear trying to rescue him. Uh, I love Al's, when they get to Al's uh, barn toy shop, that is some of the best stuff. Uh, in my opinion, this is like one of the funniest uh, movies in the Pixar movie. That's why I love it so much. I love, I love animation movies when they're really funny. And the story has great characters. I mean, come on, you know, Woody and Buzz, obviously. But then, I also love, um, uh, I love Rex. Rex is hilarious. But uh, Slinky Dog, um, I don't know, the pig, the piggy bank is great. Uh, and then Don Rickles as uh, Mr. Potato Head. I mean, the characters are so great. They work well, so well together. Like I said, and these movies are just so well made. They're just so well paced. The plot is always gr really good. And um, yeah, it all works so well. Like I said, I love I love that barn, uh, Al's toy barn. It's got some of the funniest moments, like the T-Rex the moment, the Jurassic Park uh, spoof is so funny. That's, I, that's one of the funniest scenes I've ever seen in a movie. I remember laughing so hard, like I died laughing when uh t when rex was running after the car and they look through the the side mirror and see uh great jurassic park spoof i love that and of course we meet barbie there as well and a lot of great moments there and then i love uh uh buzz lightyear meeting another buzz lightyear who doesn't understand that he's a toy so now he has to get to see what he was like through the other side of you know being annoying <laughs> and uh, being too serious and really thinking he's the real Buzz Lightyear. That was a great dynamic. And then again, one of the funniest scenes of all time, it's why I had to put it up here this high, I think, is the um, Zerg, the villain of Buzz Lightyear's like nemesis, uh, when they're fighting on top of the elevator shaft. And uh, he does the, <laughs> the Star Wars spoof of I am your father. Oh my gosh, so great. And then him falling off and and Buzz going, Father, oh my gosh. Again, another scene I died laughing. Again, this is one of the funniest movies, I think, in my opinion. Uh, funniest, one of the funniest Pixar movies, funniest animation movies. And I, again, the characters are so good. It's one of those things where it's really well-written characters, great casting, um, very funny, great plot, you know, lots of stuff going on. Never has a dull moment. 
great ending, very satisfying ending to it. And also has one of the most emotional moments in any Pixar movie or any animation movie, which is the Jesse talking about her backstory, how she was abandoned by her owner. And that's why she's so bitter. And she sings that When She Loved Me song. Oh my gosh, that's why, it, it, again, that's another reason why it's up this high. And the reason why it's my favorite Pixar movie, because I was like, you know, it's hard because like, ah, I love this. I love Monsters Incorporated. I love the original Toy Story. I was like, those were those three, I think, were my top three favorite Pixar movies. And I was like, man, which one to put number one? And then I had to think about this scene. I go, yeah, Toy Story 2, two is my, my favorite Pixar movie uh, because this scene really puts it over the top. Because, the, man, it is a emotional scene. And Sarah McLaughlin singing that song is so good. Man, maybe should have won the It was nominated for Best Song. Probably should have won. It is one of my favorite songs in movie history. Uh, yeah, I love that. Really puts it... I mean, because no other Toy Story or Pixar movie has a song that good. That, that's such an amazing song that they put in there. But yeah, Toy Story 2 here at number 24. At number 23 is actually a foreign film. Maybe the... Uh, Maybe one of only two foreign films I have on my list. I don't have a lot of foreign films. I don't watch a lot of foreign films. I'm not a big fan. But yeah, definitely my favorite foreign film of all time. And that is Life is Beautiful. Uh, which, man, would that come out in the late 90s uh, period? Um, what a unique and different movie. And one of its kind. I feel like a movie you can't make anymore. Uh, it's like controversy to it. But... Wow, yeah, 1998, yeah, nominated for a lot of Oscars. Roberto Benigni, it's an Italian film. Roberto Benigni, who I believe uh, he stars in it, he directed it, and he, I believe, wrote the movie as well. I mean, what, a, what an incredible performance by him. He ends up winning the Oscar for Best Actor for this role. And, man, his character is so good. Like, he is one of the most likable characters you ever see in movie history. Like, immediately, he's very funny. He's a comedic actor. And it's funny because this movie... If you know what this movie's about, it's about the Holocaust. Yeah. It's about the Holocaust, yet it's a very funny movie. It's like, how can you do that? Holocaust is one of the most uh, saddest, most horrible things that ever happened in history. And how do you, you know, make a movie about it and put comedy in it and not, you know, and that's the controversy. It's like, uh, can you do, Was is it right to do a Holocaust movie and put comedy in it, you know? It's very hard to do it because you don't want to, you know, uh, what's the word? You want to honor what happened there and, you know, not disgrace yourself, whatever, uh, and all that. But I think this movie does a good job at that where it's still, um, you still see the horrors of the Holocaust in here. And there's lots of sad moments, actually, in the movie. So you still have some sad moments. You still see the horror of the Holocaust in here. Um, but the comedy isn't doesn't hurt the fact that the horrible things were happening. I don't think it's making light. It's not making light of the Holocaust. That's the thing. It's like, you can't make light of it. And it doesn't. It doesn't make light of it. But somehow finds comedic moments. I think it actually does a really good job of, you know, uh, walking that thin line there um, to me. And that's why it's, of course, obviously I love it because it's at number 23 on my list. Um, it used to be in my top 10, in fact. I've always loved this movie since I first saw it. Uh, really captured me. Uh, again, uh, most of it's because Roberto Benigni is so good in this role. Um, he plays an Italian waiter, Jewish. He's a Jewish Italian waiter. He falls in love. This is another movie where it's two movies. It's 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 the first half and second half are completely different movies. Uh, what's funny is the first half is a romantic comedy. And it really has nothing to do with the Holocaust. It's really just a romantic comedy. Uh, he falls in love with he he meets this girl, falls in love with her. She's engaged to this real jerk uh, Nazi guy. Uh, but he is so in love with her. He keeps, you know, bumping into her and he's just so, you know, nice and, uh, so likable. And like I said, he's funny and all these things and romantic and he sweeps her off her feet and gets her to fall in love with him. Uh, the first half is like the best romantic comedy of all time. That's why I love this movie. I think it's actually like the first half better than the second half. The uh, second half is the Holocaust part where they're in the con concentration camp. Uh, but the first part to me is just brilliant, brilliant screenwriting. Uh, like I said, love the characters, but the way he gets her to fall in love with them is just brilliant. Like it's some of the best writing I've ever seen. And I totally believe them falling in love and it's funny and romantic and oh, so good. That first half, I absolutely love that first half so much. And second half still got some good stuff. And it's interesting because the whole second half is, 
him and his son are in, in a concentration camp because they're Jewish. And but he doesn't want his son to know that they're in the concentration. He doesn't want to know that they're in this dangerous situation in this horrible situation. He's trying to hide that from his son. He doesn't want his son to be traumatized by this. So he tells his son that this is actually like a game that they're playing. And whoever, you know, you have to obey the rules. If you obey the rules and you and you and, and when people, you know, get killed, uh, he just tells them, oh, they lost. And so they got kicked out of the game. And so they had to go back home. Basically, and he said, and if you win, you get a, a, a real tank because the boy loves tanks. And he has like a toy tank. And so the father tells him, yeah, the winner gets a tank, like a real tank, you know. So we need to stay in, you know, and not quit because the boy's like, I don't like this game. I want to go home. And, and, and the father's like, but it, it, and he does some pretty funny stuff on how to keep keep his son from knowing what the horrors that are going on around him. So it was actually a really nice thing that I mean, it's. Obviously, very unrealistic. It would never happen. But yet, there's a really niceness to it that this, the father loves his son so much that he doesn't want his son to know the horrors that are going on around him and that people are dying because they're Jewish, you know, and the, and the, and all that. And and he does it. He he kind of keeps that away from his son by playing like it's a game. Anyways, it's, it's hard to explain. But man, if you haven't seen it, definitely check this out. Life's beautiful. What a one of the one of a kind movie. I absolutely love it. Here at number 23. Number 22 is the movie I, it's the only movie in my top 100 that I don't have a physical copy of. And that's because there is no, as far as I know, there's no physical copy of this movie, which really sucks. I would love to get this movie on Blu-ray. And that is uh, Klaus, uh, which is a more recent movie. Again, it came out in like 2019. It's one of the more recent movies I have on my list. Um, and this is an animation movie that's on Netflix. So you can go on Netflix and watch this movie. It's a Netflix original kind of movie, whatever. Uh, but for some reason, Netflix has not put this out in physical media, which I really hate. Because um, like I said, I would love to have this in physical media. And I've looked it up and can't find it. They, they don't do it. So you have to go to Netflix to watch it, which sucks. It's only on streaming. But man, it is such a good movie. It's a Christmas movie. Basically, you know, uh, it's a really unique, uh, pretty... I love this idea, this origin story of Santa Claus, basically. It's called Klaus, but Klaus is kind of like Santa Claus. Like, and it's kind of, it's, I, I don't know if it's a foreign movie, but the, the movie takes place, like, I want to say in, in the, uh, what do you call it? Like in Sweden kind of area. And, you know, it's kind of a Nordic uh, area that the movie takes place in. And that's why it's called Klaus, you know, because it has like that Nordic sound to it um, instead of just Klaus. Um, anyways, but yeah, it is the best. It's, it's, to be honest, probably my favorite Christmas movie now. And it's only came out in 2019, but I've seen this a couple of times. And man, I just fell in love with this movie. It's funny. I remember it came out and people were talking about it. And I was like, oh, I, I don't know why. I wasn't that interested in it. And Toy Story 4 came out that year and won the Oscar for Best Animation Movie. Klaus was nominated for Best Animation Movie as well. So it was really well received by critics. And uh, everybody I heard really liked the movie. And so I was like... It was one of the movies like, ah, I need to get to it. But for some reason, I kept putting off, putting off. So it was it was a couple of years after that movie came out, probably, that I finally was like, okay, I'm going to sit down and watch this on Netflix. And man, it blew me away how great it was. Like, again, I love a good Christmas movie. And I love, uh, again, I don't know if we've done a movie this good about the origin story of Santa Claus. Like, because I, I think that's a really interesting subject matter. Like, how does Santa Claus become Santa Claus? And we've got a couple of movies about it and they haven't, they're like, eh, they're okay. But I don't think they've been, I don't think it's been perfectly told until this movie. Well, I'm like, oh man, this is such a great story about Santa Claus. And Santa Claus is not even the main character. It's actually this uh, mailman character uh, played by, uh, uh, I want to say David Schwartzman, I believe the name of the actor, who's very funny in the movie. Anyways, in the main character, he kind of gets... Uh, his dad is like the head of the the postal service or something like that. And he's just like this brat kid who just lives off of the, his dad's money. So his dad makes him work for it and makes him go to this, uh, this town way out of no middle of nowhere, basically. And it's like the worst town to, to live in because the people that live there are, there's a big rivalry. There's like a, a Hatfield McCoy's kind of thing where there's two rival families hate each other. And they're constantly at war with each other and constantly want to, you know, destroy the other side. And so he kind of gets put into this bad situation and he's told that he has to, you know, 
do be successful as a mailman in this area and then he can come back home you know uh to his mansion that you know his dad lives in and so it's kind of one of these things where he just doesn't really care about anything he just wants to get back home to live his you know uh lavish lifestyle anyway so uh he's not necessarily like the most likable character at first um he doesn't really care about anybody or being a good person or anything but and he and so he uses he kind of comes up with the Santa Claus idea in order to because he just wants to get people people won't I guess people aren't using mail at all or something like that because people hate each other and it's a very bitter town and it's very cold there of course and so he tells the kids that if they're good that's you know Santa Claus will give them toys and stuff like that so the kids start being good and because he makes up this whole story of the Santa Claus character well and then he meets this guy who is a like a wood shop guy who lives by himself in this, you know, and it's kind of a loner and it, I, it's hard to explain, but they kind of become, well, they're, they're not friends at first, but they kind of start becoming friends and he helps them out because he can make toys. Cause he's a, he's good with um, uh, making things out of wood and stuff like that. So he kind of gets him to make toys for the kids and he gives, you know, gives them to the kids and then the kids write letters to Santa. So that's the way, because he has to get so much uh, mail to get back to his dad. So he's really just trying to manipulate the kids to write these letters to a fake, you know, person, Santa Claus, uh, in order to get what he wants. But by doing that, he actually makes everything better because the kids start being nice to each other. And then some of the adults start being nice to each other. And so the town kind of changes from this. I love that. I love the whole just arc of this town being this really horrible town to actually becoming a better town. And people are because of him, they start becoming better people and becoming nicer people and all this. And like, there's the local teacher who doesn't care about her job. She hates teaching, but then she learns to love teaching because the kids started being nice and they want to learn. And so she starts finding her love of teaching and she starts, and she just wants to get out of there. Her whole thing is that she wants to raise money to get out of there. And all of a sudden she's using the money to buy supplies for her school. And so she, we see her change into this bitter person to being an actually, you know, you know, someone who, you know, starting to like the kids and starting to like what she does and make an impact in the, in their community. So I don't know, I don't know, I'm explaining a lot of the movie, but it is so good. Um, I love the animation. It's, um, it's kind of this, uh, combination of, it looks like almost like 2D animation, but also has a lot of the, the cinematography of like a computer animated movie, uh, you know. So it's kind of a combination of 2D and like, you know, more modern day. I don't know. It's a very unique and just the shading, the color shading and everything is really great. Like I love the animation overall. Like I said, it's a very funny movie at times and it's a really cool plot. Like I said, I love the arc of all the characters, especially like the Santa Claus character. Uh, Cause he's kind of this loner who's, you know, very bitter and it's not friendly. Uh, and then we find his backstory. Like when you find out about his backstory, it's so heartbreaking. Like it's one of the saddest moments in the movie that it's like, uh, there's a couple times where I cry watching this movie and that's why I love it so much. Uh, it's funny yet very heartbreaking and emotional at times and also very happy at times. But his backstory was great when you find out about that. Um, and then like there's this kid that can't speak English and he, he and so, but he finally gets, he, there's this moment where he, they make a sled for this kid and we see this the kid like on the sled and there's this great moment where they have this really cool song, like a really great song, very emotional. It's another emotional mo moment where the kid's having fun on the sled and there's this really cool song that's really bringing out the emotions of the scene. So there's a lot of great stuff like that in it. Um, and then there's, of course, a twist where they find out that he's actually there to just get, you know, he just wants to get mail so he can get back to his father. So there's a whole twist of like, oh, he's not really cares about anybody, but he, he does because he he goes from this unlikable, uncareable person to being someone who really cares about everybody and wants to help the town. So it's a great character arc for him as well. Um, we also get the last uh, Norm MacDonald uh, performance. Norm MacDonald has a small part in this movie, uh, which I love when I hear his voice. I'm like, oh, I miss Norm MacDonald. He was so great. Um, so it's cool. He plays a, a minor character in the movie as well. And then the ending is just so emotional. Oh my gosh. I've seen this movie two or three times and I cry every time at that ending. I can't say what happens, but uh, like I said, we see the one character become more and more like Santa Claus. And, you know, at the end, he, yeah, I can't say what happens, but man, 
and I love the friendship. What really, what really wins the movie over for me is the friendship between the Santa Claus character and the main, I forget his name now, but the, the main character, the mailman, their friendship, because amazing, because at first they really don't like each other, of course, it's that whole thing. And then, but you see them kind of grow in their friendship. And at the very end, they're like best friends. And it is, it's really cool. I think they do such a good job with that. And then the ending, again, it's so emotional, really brings home the movie. Like, I thought it was a really good movie. And then that ending, that's why it's not number 22 on my list. That ending is so good. It's one of the best endings I've ever seen in a movie that really moves me emotionally that I was like, oh my gosh, this is like one of the best movies I've ever seen. It's just, it's that good. It blew me away. Only on a couple of watches. Definitely check it out, Klaus, if you haven't, on Netflix. It is so good. Like I said, uh, one to me, probably the best animation movie I've ever seen, which is crazy because there's so many great animation movies out there. Uh, well, it's second. There's one more animation movie above it. I forgot, but it's so it's like the second, my second favorite animation movie of all time. To be honest, it's my favorite Christmas movie now. It's kind of moved up that much. I mean, that's how good this movie is. Definitely check out Klaus. So good at number 22 on my list. All right, <clears throat> last movie I'm talking about, number 21, is the, like I said, this is the final movie of one, probably my favorite series, one of my favorite series of all time, and that is Harry Potter and the Deathly Hallows Part Two. Uh, I believe, what, the eighth movie in the eight um, Harry Potter franchise, and man, what a great, satisfying ending. I mean, of course, there's two Deathly Hallows movies based off of the last book, The Deathly Hallows. Um, which is my favorite book in the series. It is because uh, it has an ending. I love, like I said, my my favorite movie in the franchise usually is the last movie because it usually does a good job of closing all the you know all the plot points. Plus, you finally get a, a satisfying ending where the villain finally gets vanquished, you know, and the heroes get to you know live, you know, they get to ride off in the sunset. And you feel satisfied. You finally feel like, all right, I feel satisfied with the way this movie ended. I thought they did such a good job of ending it. Uh, great adaptation of a great book, in my opinion. Uh, though they changed maybe some things around, still they did everything that you're supposed to do in this movie, I think. Um, yeah, it's so cool because uh, uh, some great moments. I mean, uh, the whole break into Gringotts Bank is a really great whole uh, whole scene. It's great. It's, um love what they do there and then they have to break into hogwarts so i mean uh those two there's kind of like two big moments in the movie i'd say uh, both really great oh they have to break into is it no that might be the first movie that they break yeah never mind but yeah those are great and then that uh the, the ending fight scene which takes up a lot of the last part of this movie is uh they're all the good witches and wizards are in hogwarts in Voldemort, and all the bad ones are trying to attack and yeah there's just so many great moments and it's hard to say it's so well written because the book is so good and i can't spoil too much but i mean what they do with the potter character and um yeah i don't know what to say except you know there's a moment where you think he's going to die and then he something else happens and it's absolutely incredible uh also uh i forgot now i'm forgetting his name but uh one character who's kind of the always kind of the the fat clumsy character that's always made fun of in the movies has one of the greatest moments where he has to kill the the snake that's part of the one of the horcruxes and such a great redemption for that character it's like wow he was such a great character and great character arc for him as well and just the final confrontation between harry potter and Voldemort is so great i think it's really well done ends in such a satisfactory manner uh what can you say? Good versus the, uh, I mean, and you got the uh, Bella Chicks Lestrange against Molly Weasley. Oh my gosh, one of the greatest moments of all time as well. Uh, we get the kiss scene between uh, Ron Weasley and Hermione Granger, which we've been waiting for for a long time. We know those two are gonna fall in love. We know those two are gonna kiss at some point. And when they do, it's amazing. You're like, oh yes, this was a great way to show that we knew that they would fall in love. So it has all of that in here. Uh, man, just very well, uh, I guess, I don't know say, it's well written, but the, the book is well written. So it's a great adaptation of a great book. My favorite, to be honest, my favorite, my favorite uh, sci-fi series, my favorite, um, as far as books go, I love Harry Potter. It's my favorite book series of all time. 
Uh, I've read those books like three times now through the whole series. Um, and these movies, I have all these movies on Blu-ray. Love going back and watching these. I think they're really well done. Like I said, everything like special effects, costuming, you know, makeup. Production-wise, amazing. Casting, it's some of the best casting ever. It's got some of the greatest British actors of all time. And I mean, yet the, uh, uh, what's her name, just passed away. Uh, Maggie Smith, who just passed away recently, is so good. Here's McGonagall. Uh, it's, it's great character. I mean, it's I don't know what to say. I, I'm trying to capitalize how much I love this movie series and how this movie just ends it in such a great emotional, satisfactory way that by the end of this, I'm just so happy at the end. It's like, oh my gosh. And they even do the scene where they go like in the future when they're adults and they have their own kids and they're seeing their kids off to Hogwarts. Amazing way to end the series and emotional, uh, feel emotionally happy at the end. I love these characters. By the, by the time you get this movie, it's like, man, I love these characters so much and I want to see good things happen because there are a lot of sad moments, actually. There's a lot of bad and sad moments through the series. And so when you get to the series, uh, also Draco Malfoy has a great redemption as well. So you get great redemption characters. You get great villain characters that get uh, finally defeated that you've been waiting to see killed. You got some, like the I said, the Green Gots. You got a great bank heist uh, part of the movie. Uh, again, oh, oh, I, I, I didn't mention Snape. Oh my gosh. Uh, again, um, uh, what's his name? The actor that plays uh, Alan Rickman. Alan Rickman should have got an Oscar nomination. He is so good as Snape. One of the greatest characters of all time, I think. And again, greatest. Probably the greatest redemption arc of all time, maybe outside of Darth Vader. Because you don't know, is he good, is he bad? And then the way they did that character at the end, one of the greatest scenes of, of all time is when you find out about Snape's backstory. That scene just gets me every time. Again, a very emotional scene that just gets me emotional every time I see it. It's so well done. It's great in the book. I think they did a great job in the movie showing that part where you find out, oh, this is why Snape is the way he is or why he made the choices or... We see some background of like why he did what he did. I thought it was perfectly done. And I guess, spoil it, he, he was in love with Harry Potter's mom, Lily Potter, Lily Potter, since he was, you know, a kid. And yeah, so when you find out that, oh, he was in love with Lily Potter, we, we never, Lily Potter, we never knew that really to that point. And that's why he made a lot of the decisions that he did. And he again not spoil too much but he gets redeemed as a character where you go oh man i love snape he's such a great character like i said be honest my favorite character in the movie series and one of the greatest movie characters of all time rickman again rest in peace rick rickman such a great actor did such an amazing job one of the greatest british actors i think uh i would say character actors but just a great actor that i wish he was still around because he's so good uh some really memorable performances and this is probably my favorite performance of his as well so yeah again that's why i had to be up this high at 21 almost top 20 movie because it's the ending to one of the greatest franchises of all time one of my favorite franchises and some of the greatest scenes i've ever seen in a movie so yeah say what you will some don't like harry potter some like it i, I don't know what to say i absolutely love it what a great movie great ending to the franchise so that's harry potter and deathly hallows part two at number 21 so this video has probably gone kind of long. It's Once I get to these movies I really love, I, it's hard not to spend a lot of time talking about why I love them so much. So hopefully you got that idea. And hopefully if you haven't seen any of these movies, hopefully I can convince you to check these movies out. They are so good. Um, they're all five out of five star movies, obviously. Um, but yeah, besides that, free, feel free to comment in, or write in the comments. What do you think about these movies? Have you seen them? Do you love them as well? um love to read your comments anyways but besides that thank you for watching the video thank you for liking it and thank you to all my subscribers for supporting the channel i appreciate you all i hope you have a good day